what is it like to be you right now? That's the basic attitude and question we have when we do coaching or therapy. What is it like to be this person, you, right this moment, with your history, your feelings, your capacities, your worries, everything? What is it like to be you? Schön, dass du wieder reinhörst. Ich begrüße dich ganz herzlich beim Ich wir alle Podcast. Wir bei Shortcuts laden hier interessante Personen ein, die uns zu den Themen Selbst, Team und Werteentwicklung inspirieren. Mehr Informationen zum Podcast, zur aktuellen Folge und unseren Angeboten findest du in den Shownotes und bei ichwiralle.com. Ich bin Martin Permatier und präsentiere dir heute ein Gespräch mit Susanne cook -Reuter. Susanne ist neben der Entwicklungspsychologin Jane Levinger die wichtigste Forscherin auf dem Gebiet der Ich-Entwicklung. Sie lernte die Forschung zum Ego Development Ende der 60er Jahre bei Jane Levinger in Harvard kennen und hat sich seitdem insbesondere der Forschung der späteren transpersonalen Haltung gewidmet. Ohne sie wäre unser Modell der Haltung in dieser Form nie entstanden. Sie ist gebürtige Schweizerin, aber lebt schon so lange in den USA, dass wir in diesem Podcast Englisch sprechen werden. Für mich ist es eine ganz besondere Freude, mich mit Susanne auszutauschen, da ich viel von ihr lernen konnte und ihre vielfältige Weisheit und Einfachheit genieße. Deswegen ist es auch ein sehr langer Podcast geworden. Bevor das Gespräch beginnt, noch der Hinweis zu unserem Netzwerk für Wachstumsgefährtinnen. Auf verhaltung-erweitern.de findest du unsere Community mit Infos, Tipps, Events, Gruppen und ganz vielen Austauschmöglichkeiten. Wir freuen uns riesig, wenn du dabei bist. Und jetzt wünsche ich dir ganz viel Inspiration und Freude beim Hören. Audio ab! Hello here at Ich wir alle. Today we have something new because it's my first podcast in English. And I have a very special guest here, Susanne Kukolter. Hello, Susanne. Hello. I wish my German was still fluent enough to actually respond in German. It's a pain when you spend, what is it, 46 years in a foreign country and everything you do, I even dream in English. Yes. And I have very few opportunities to practice German. I just lost it. I can no longer just speak. I can, of course, read it, but not speak it. <laughs> That's interesting because you're a scientist in psychological development and the model you use, you know, you took it up from Jane Levinger and became, I guess, the leading scientist after her to develop that model a bit further has to do with language. Yes. And that was the, that I'm still think the only person in our field that is fully aware of the power of language in in so many ways and that was the, the beauty of the finding her model i was in 68 maybe was it in 68 and i see that's now being really old that you suddenly can't remember dates and, and names anyway i took a class at harvard on developmental theories and hers was one of them And I took to it because it was the only one that focused in its test primarily on language. And I was a linguist from the University of Zurich trained in semantics. So it was natural to me to combine psychology and her approach, looking at how people make sense of their life. So how was that experience, you being a linguist and hearing her? So what clicked in you when you heard about her theory? That it was, A, it seemed like a relevant theory. It fit my own. And like when you talked earlier about how you it came door to you, a portal, it explained things to me in a way that I had not had it explained before. And then I learned how to score the test in the same year. And from then on, The train was off and I, <laughs> I really focused for, for so many years just on that theory and how to test it and how to improve it. And I very quickly also, that was just a happenstance of life. 
I came across responses that did not fit her theory, and I could not be scored with her manuals, their manuals, to score a test. You compare what somebody writes to a long list of what others have said, and that's organized. And so then I got curious and started collecting those responses that seemed reasonable, logical, that resonated with my own understanding of life, but that could not be scored with her theory or her manuals. So did you work closely together with her at that time? Not closely. She all, <laughs> she really was a tough, and, and many other students said the same. She was tough. She challenged me. She said, you were, you know, don't... <laughs> I laugh because I never took, I took her very seriously as a scholar, but I didn't take her seriously in her attitude towards me. So at some point she said, don't you call it Co Lovinger Cook Kreuter, your theory, just call it Cook Kreuter. And I have never listened to that because I really, <laughs> I, I stand on her shoulders so completely mm -hmm. that I really wanted to be called Lovinger Cook Kreuter, not just my name. So why did she oppose that? Because she thought there was not, What she intended it to be? Or? Well, yes, she didn't want me to do the later stages when I started to ask her, you know, what do you think? And eventually after rejecting it, and I met her at her 80th birthday, for instance, tiny person sitting on a big table where she was really the tiniest. I'm not very big, but she was even smaller and, and so sovereignly leading that conference that meeting i mean really was it fascinating but she said your your ideas are in the, in the stratosphere we don't even want to bother with them and when i didn't give up she said well now prove it if you really think this is something serious <laughs> prove it so i had to go back to school to prove it uh, interesting and how did you prove it by actually analyzing by then i had four thousand tests by analyzing them, them looking at patterns, by describing the underlying structure of development that's, that I could see behind the levels, which is something she didn't have. And interestingly enough, Kohlberg, the moral development philosopher, he critiqued her theory and said, that's a soft theory. It doesn't have an underlying structure. Mine is a hard theory, a real theory. <laughs> the two of them were always a little bit odds with each other. In that sense, a little bit competitive, I thought. But anyway, I did think I found it with the perspectives, with the growing perspectives. And that is actually what I'm happier about and think is a bigger contribution than just talking about late stages. Late stages came about because it was a curiosity of mine, but it's not something I'm terribly attached to. And why were you curious? Because of yourself, of own experiences? Yes, exactly. And because those responses made sense. Her highest stage basically says you have a very integrated self, and it does never take into account that you can let go of the self, that you don't necessarily stay with needing a clear identity, that it's much more fluid, much more in the moment. And that just didn't, I guess, maybe it wasn't in her experience or she didn't appreciate that kind of exploration. That's interesting because sometimes one says the lower cannot see the higher, like you can only really understand the stages that you have some reference experiences in maybe not habitual but you have some references so you have an idea i could be like this but i have it maybe two seconds and some people maybe have it two hours <laughs> so that is part of it that i think that is true of all developmental theories that it's easier to understand and and that you've gone through all of it and therefore you have an affinity and compassion for other stages and that earlier stages simply do not understand. I think she was a fantastic scientist. She was excellent talking. She had a very broad perspective on life, could quote Plato and, you know, she was really well informed, but she was probably late conventional. 
like many, many scientists. And she was a skeptic, and I actually like that in her. She was skeptical of her own theory, and, and the very last book, she wrote a chapter titled The Completing of a Life Sentence. <laughs> but it, she meant it seriously. She wanted really to be a social worker, somebody who helps directly. And she ended up being sort of pushed into this role as professor and ego development expert. And I think it wasn't what she truly wanted. Now, I may, that's my interpretation. But it made me sad, and I thought twice about whether I should actually do a dissertation on this. Was I really passionate enough to want to do this or not? And I clearly was, so that solved it for me. But it was touching to hear, see her write that that way. Uh, but that's interesting because, uh, as you say, you are standing on her shoulder, and she was probably standing on the shoulders of Eric Erickson. And many others, yes. And many others and thousand years back and so on, the people who even invented language. Yeah. And at the same time, you see you're only one chain in, or one, one part of a chain, and then somebody else comes and adds something and somebody else comes and adds something. And that's what you probably, what others now do with, with this theory. They shape it through their own preferences and own ideas, and, and that to me is a healthy thing. Another thing that was interesting that I learned from her is she was so protective. She said, you can only use it for research. You can never use it with other human beings. And we use it, obviously, as a means to support others in their growth and in their self-understanding. So I learned that you have to have your theory have children. It has to, life theory has to go out and take new shapes whether you sometimes agree with it or not. It, it is the nature of good science that it evolves and that new critiques come in and, and all of that. And to try and keep it exactly the way you created it seems to me rather short-lived or unhealthy almost. Interesting when you say that because I read her manuals you know, on how to score and I thought, well, that may be maybe true in the 60s and 70s when she wrote it. Well, that is another thing there, of course. But ego development theory, too, we now have responses we never had 20 years ago. Exactly. And also, I could feel the filter on, or I, I, I thought I could feel the filter of her own system, of her own biography, in the way she explains things. Because I said, yes, that's because it was in your life like this. Yes, <laughs> that's so for all of us. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We can't escape who we are. We always filter whatever through who we have already become and who we might become. Yes, and, and thinking about that, you know, you said you started at 68, so hey, you were there when the hippies were coming. So the whole idea of higher states and transpersonal consciousness was much more in the air probably than when she started in the 50s. Or even earlier, yes, of course. And she was a pioneer in terms of being the first uh, woman professor psychologist because men said in those times that women can't do psychology, uh, psychometrics, especially the statistical aspects of it, things like that. Yes, we're shaped by the times we live in and grew up. And so did she do the first test with you? Did she test your stage? Uh, I know a colleague of mine, I think, did. And then did you redo them for over the years or you just made them once? No, I did it once. It didn't seem much meaningful to repeat. Repeat it also because the more you know about it, the less accurate it obviously is. It, it is a test that's based on spontaneous responses for people. And, and that's one of the problems nowadays. So many people have read and know about developmental theories. They're trying to game it, of course, totally human, but <laughs> it's then harder to do a good job scoring them. So yes, if the aim is to score, you know. <laughs> well, to be act to, to really get a sense where somebody is at most of the time. When they try to game it, Mo again, a well-trained scorer, of course, discovers some of that. 
Yes, yeah, it's, it's hard not to. It's hard not to once you know. <laughs> But it's also not something you can be certain about ever. You can't be certain about another human being's meaning making. You can have inklings about it, but I would never say you are that. Yes, that's that why I also think it's more and more of a fluid concept. We talked about that. I do not call it stages or stufen, but, but haltungen. So tem more temporarily. Because that's how I perceive it, but you know, and that still there's a habitual mindset or habitual haltung that, that dominates our behavior. That's right. And that's the one we're trying, ego development tries to capture what is it you most automatically and routinely use in making sense of your experience. So you didn't say once you visited her on the 80th birthday, did you say, Thank you for uh, giving birth to a new level of no, my theory. I, no? I, I, no, I was already writing about the dissertation. I said, you, can I send you a copy before it's published? And she said, yeah, well, okay, okay. I'll read it <laughs> when I'm at the dentist. And I have to again. <laughs> <laughs> it was really something she didn't want to do. She just didn't trust it. I, <laughs> it's okay. But it's interesting. Wouldn't one expect a different attitude in later stages? Well, you know, again, if she were later stage, you can be a fantastic professor and scientist and not be at a later stage. You can be... Wouldn't you have to be at a later stage to score a later stage? Well, to some degree, yes. And that when we train people, we generally expect them to be post-conventional, yes. Mm -hmm. And you think she is... You think she was not post-conventional? Uh, probably, yes. But a fantastic scientist, a fantastic person, you know, thoughtful, mindful, capable, just not in... And also the interests. Interesting. But, but didn't she want to upgrade in her own model? <laughs> I guess not. As I said, she felt she got stuck in the role. It was not what she originally, her heart had set up to do in her life. She wanted to be good social uh, worker, helping women in, in, in underprivileged areas to have better lives. That was even before the women's consciousness raising. It's interesting, you know, when, when she, her description of self-conscientious, I think she calls it, the, 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 the E6. Yeah, conscientious is that one. A conscientious, yes. Yes. And I thought she's writing about herself. Yes, and that, I think that is a, a good word for her. Because the way she frames it, I thought, this is your experience of, you know, working hard and, and you know, <laughs> of, of being this, I'm able, I'm intelligent, I'm in, con in contact with my strength, but I can't break out of conventions. <laughs> Well, you can't think that when you're in the convention, when you are, it's part of the, the filter, the blindness, you can't know that you are actually limited that way. Uh -huh. She was, in my view, her best self, and she was not interested in late stages. Later stages, <laughs> what she had in, identified. So you made it a career model for the hippies. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just was curious. If you ask me what are your main strengths, I would say endless curiosity, a capacity to question even my own ideas, and a love of humans, of, of <laughs> life. <laughs> so that's, that's another interesting thing that interests me. If you say curiosity and also question your own ideas, since you are in, in touch with these ideas since whatever, 46 years, they probably have evolved in your own mind. So they are not what, you know, the little student, Suzanne, who was sitting there at Harvard, had an idea, ah, oh, this is this. And then, of course, I guess it transformed what it is, what it's good for. I would actually like to share a tidbit that is important in my own becoming. So I went to elite gymnasium in Switzerland and we were taught everything from art to gym. We had to learn all the things that athletes do not to do them well, but just to have a sense of what they're like and what your body can do or some bodies can do well. And we had 
as you know, several languages in Switzerland, and we were all, for, I don't know what year, must have been six years into French. We read Les Pascal's Les Pensées. And somewhere in there, he says, man compared to universe is a nothingness, and man compared to nothingness is a universe. And it struck me, it was like, oh my God, that explains so much of, of my experience. And the teacher even used math to explain it to us. And 20 years later, we had a class reunion and I was trying to, you know, we reminisced. And I said, do you remember that fantastic idea? And people, everybody had forgotten about it. It was transformative for me to hear that, to read Pascal, but not to everybody else in the class. Because you had reference experience in that area, like you, you had some states where you thought, what is this? You know, I'm alive. <laughs> I was trying to figure out who, what it is to be a human being, what it is like, what it does it mean to be wise. And, and that captured me and I used it later for that's part of the construct aware stage, the awareness that we're great in comparison to <laughs> nothing, but that we're also very, very limited. We're just a speck of dust in the universe. And that is part of what the construct aware person becomes aware of, that relativity, whereas earlier at the stage just before, people are well-developed, they're strategic, they have long-term history awareness, they look into the future, you know, they have a sense of future generation, not just now, but they're also proud of what they have achieved, how much they understand. Good reasons, they do understand more than a good, you know, 80% of, of people they meet, but only the next stage has then that humility to see the in between the paradox, what I call the Pascalian paradox. Yeah, that, that I find very interesting that before that we are bound in dualistic thinking in a way. And I don't know who coined the, the term dialectic for the next stages. Maybe it was Thomas Binder, the dialectic understanding that suddenly you see that. There's a long tradition of thinking about dialectical thinking. The threefoldness of things, you see, one and the other and the one in the middle. and Or the one above. The even or the one above. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the training in voice dialogue. In the Zen tradition, you actually look at the tensions. Yes, you go beyond on either side or you go above and look at the whole system. Yes, these are all fascinating ways of experiencing new new ways of seeing things. like. That I remember the Zen training in that. Fascinating. So that, that was where you got your reference experience in Zen training, partially. In, in Zen training, I did 13 years of Kriya Yoga, which is actually still more embedded in me than the Zen. Zen is a good practice. But it's not, well, it, all together, all these different strands inform you it's hard to separate them. but the having good ideas or or wonderful ideas which was by the way a title of professor's class when i first went to harvard as a master's student that again pick up things that delight me i thought that was a wonderful title for a class so i used it for telling the nautilus story but yeah Yes, you, you want to share the Nautilus story, the, the world of wonder. <laughs> that is the other thing that I didn't mention, of curiosity and the sense of wonder that permeates my days, really. So it was, what year was it? When my dad died, 78. So I was at the conference at Harvard from the, Res the Society for Research in Adult Development, and I was scheduled to give a speech on Saturday. On Friday, there were many presentations, and one had to do with how researchers, you look at slides, bacterial slides, can tell whether the person, whether there's something wrong or whether <laughs> something is right. It was very abstract, but there were all these pictures of, of different kinds of bacteria, 
moving and doing. So anyway, I hear in the afternoon I get back and I hear that my father had died. Now we have had a difficult relationship in many ways. He never understood. He called me a blue stocking. He said, you will never, you should should become a housewife and go to, you know, to the French speaking part and learn French and housekeeping. He didn't understand that I was interested intellectually in things. And so we had a tough time. And I was, of course, upset because when somebody dies that you have had conflicts with, it's, it's a time to really go deep and reflect. And I couldn't get a plane back to Zurich, to where it was in Arau, but get back before Sunday night. So I debated whether I should go to the conference the next day, and I said, oh, I might as well. But in the night, I had this weird, weird dream. First, it was all these slides with the bacteria, and eventually they started moving in a certain movement in a spiral movement in a big cauldron like a soup and suddenly I saw a nautilus and it was like oh my god this is what development is about it it is a spiral in some ways the last chamber is always open to the environment wherever the last chamber is there's an openness and I've been using that as a logo for for ever since. It really was one of those striking moments and it came in a dream. So what was the feeling that you had in that dream? Was it like a lucid dream or was a certain emotion connected to it? I don't even remember it so long ago, but it was a, seemed like a real dream. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether it was lucid or, I mean, half awake. Maybe that's more likely that when we have these interesting ideas, it's in the twilight zone between sleep and and being awake. Did you have the feeling, oh, this is my unconscious, you know, kind of working out the puzzle of the daily association or was there a different quality? Well, that was the one of the interpretations one can have afterwards. But while it happened, it was just miraculous to me and beautiful and strange how things, you know, morph from from something concrete into something so different. Yeah, that, that still is part of what I also hope when you're in nature, suddenly these things happen. Like coincidences or something appears in your mind or you see something and associate something. Yes, and it connects in some ways it hasn't before. That to me is always delightful. Sometimes it's difficult things, but it doesn't matter. It's just that openness to surprise and to wonder that that really makes certainly my life still fascinating. Yeah, and I find that interesting because you are the specialist for the transpersonal stages, which also means the stages where you are more connected to what comes behind language or before language. Yes. Whatever, without, um, sometimes we talk about unlanguaging experience because we're so trained, so automatically use, <laughs> explaining everything that happens, even when we're not speaking, it happens in our minds. We evaluate, we judge, we put it into buckets. We That's what we as human beings do, and that's true for all cultures. I haven't found one that doesn't do that. But the buckets are quite different, and the overall, the cosmologies are different. But then human nature to want to explain what's happening, that is seems to be universal. And this is something interesting to being in nature. And, you know, scientists have investigated and said it heals to be in nature. It even heals people where they look out of the hospital room and they see nature. So what do you think communicates with us? What is this that we are in nature and part of us says, oh, I need to go to the forest, you know? <laughs> to to connect with something. And then you start to see in, in this nonverbal way. What do you think is it? 
I really wouldn't know to put labels on it. Yes. I no, I don't, because I think it's different for different people what they get out of it. I think even just being in the f- fresh air makes a difference. And the smells, the different smells, perhaps hearing a bird or all the things that are part of forest, for instance. You know, in Japan, they have forest bathing. That's actually a thing people do as, as a practice. Because they live in so many live in big cities and don't have the access to that, and just just to watch, I like to watch till I feel I I become one with whatever it is I'm I'm really really entering, and there's a practice. Do you have you heard of the three to one nature mysticism practice? Tell me. Well, first you go out, and we do it when we teach. We send people out to find an object that talks to them. Anything could be a stone. I've once had a person who had the air between where we were and the mountain, anything. And then you start really like a scientist, third person in perspective to what it is, everything you can know about it. Where, who lives with it? Where does it live? Does it have companions nearby? Where is it coming from? What will it be when in a thousand years? Will it be rock or whatever? Everything you can find out. When is it blooming? Who lives in it or under it? Who eats it? Everything you can think of. And then in the next day, you go out and talk to your chosen object. Becomes no now a thou, not an object, and you ask it questions about your life and see what it answers you. Interesting. And the the fascinating thing is if you do this, it actually will. You will get answers. And then the third is to become it, to actually, you know, become that tree or that whatever it is you're looking at. And that's interesting that you say that because what comes to my mind is this sensation nature talks. Yes. But without ah. words, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, but it communicates. You know, you look at the flowers and suddenly you realize, oh gosh, they're looking at me. <laughs> In some ways, and there is research that plants A communicate with each other and that they communicate with us too if we are sensitized to listen and not just miss it as stupid or you know, nonsense. Right. And then when you look at nature, you like Walt Whitman, you know, leaves of grass. And he said, there's no, not two leaves of grass that are the same. That is part of the realization as well. Yes. Variety, 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 and more and more and more. And that's actually what life is. Yes. Many. Yeah. Uh, that's what fascinates me about that. Did I tell you that I'm writing a book about animals around Walden Pond with a colleague from Sydney. Mm -hmm. And it is a fable. So it's a developmental fable where each stage is an animal. And this sea otter from Australia comes to Walden Pond. I live five minutes from this pond. So it's very part of my daily, you know, environment. And I'm the resident owl. And I invite him to stay and come and meet all these characters around the pond. And I'm drawing the characters. And when I do, that is the, what I'm talking about. You look so carefully at some, usually a photograph, but you do it with such attention and love that eventually every stroke you do with your pencil is like a, a caress of the, that, whatever you're drawing. And that gives me as much pleasure as the dialogues this colleague and I have pretending to be <laughs> the owl and the author and visiting these characters and interacting with them. It's just so much fun. And the theoretical book is, to say the least, not as much fun. And joy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to to admit that but it's true and at this age you want to do things that really are passionate about and that give you delight not things that you must do i've done the thing i must do (laughs) i'm looking forward to that because somebody once asked me how would you explain 
the ideas of ego development to a child. My colleague's daughter is maybe 10 or 11, and she's, he's already shared the diplomat chapter with her, the bees who are, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, oh, my God, I understand why I don't fit, because she's already beyond that. But the class and the other kids, of course, are wherever they, where they're supposed to be developmentally. That is always so... You often experience yourself as an outlier when, you know, you're a nonconformist. If you if you don't fit the stage that everybody else sort of in general is at, yeah, I think it could be for for certainly little older children as well. What I find interesting, you say this this experience of nature, which can be nonverbal, which we actually do have as very young beings. Then language comes, you know, and we get caught up in this having a language, being the language, identifying with the language and identifying with the pictures, this hypnotic stage of, of language creates in us. And then we somehow deconstruct it a bit or try to deconstruct our hypnotic state of, of uh, trying to grasp the world with language, I guess. Yes. But some people are naturally more capable of, of Keeping that childlike wonder, for instance, that doesn't need work, just letting experience come in through all the senses. And certainly our institutions tend to want to abuse us <laughs> from this early childlike sense of being and make us into reasonable, rational, responsible, whatever adults. And the whole, all the systems are geared towards doing that. In, in, I guess, in Germany, in the US, in Switzerland, that's the goal to have different adults. So I had this, this thought experience. If you would have different kinds of humanities and you would put them on different planets. Yeah. So let, let's say you, you take the Homo sapiens 100,000 years ago and you put them on different planets and see what happens. So here on earth, we somehow constructed what we did in our world with growth and everything. And somehow, it looks like our external history has to do with our developmental history. You know, we, we created the religions, we created science, we created economy, and maybe we create something else. Would you think there would be other ways to go through the stages collectively and individually than we do? I tend to actually not want to speculate too much. To me, that is wonderful in this speculation. I don't know that I often end up saying I simply don't know because projecting into the future is one of, again, one of humanity's favorite things to do, but we can't. You cannot project. You can sort of guess a little bit what came before and then I speculate how it might be later. We can't really know, and that's perhaps something I have felt uh, critiqued even in the integral context when I wrote that paper, assumptions versus assertions in, I think it was 2013, quite a while back, because there's a lot of, of assumptions in integral as well. And some of the predictions, you know, the 20%, whatever, teal, then the world will be a better place. To me, that is just not sustainable. It's wonderful. It gives us hope. But it's not based on anything we know or can prove or can be certain about. Who knows what's going to happen? Particularly now, as since AI came on the scene, I'm I'm just flabbergasted of what the Gen X generation sort of says about their future <laughs> and and where all of this is going. The the cyborgs, you know, artificial parts of humans. I don't know. I find that interesting because it says in the earlier stages, you, you think a lot about the future. Yes. And then you become more present. You let bit go of the idea of future. You say, well, I don't know. <laughs> Let's see what happens because we, everything else is illusionary to plan and to think and project. So, but then it becomes interesting, you know, what happens with you when you let go of, of the idea of knowing about the future. What is the source you're connected to? What gives you trust, hope, or you let even go of that? There's no trust, the hope, just an open stage. Please, for me, there would be, there is, 
trust in the minute to minute experience. I'm alive. I mean, I wake up every morning and and say, Hooray, I'm still alive. More than that, we cannot hope. <laughs> I I can't hope. So there are people who hope of an afterlife. There are people who really so earnestly try to grow to a more comprehensive stage, you know, all embracing. I don't know. I have never felt the urge to consciously develop myself. Life brings you tons of different challenges and heartaches and beautiful things, and sometimes all at once. So so your development, did you didn't do it. It happened. Yes, that's how I would say. It was harder, but it was the environment. There were many influences that helped it. So, but that's that's an interesting uh, point because, of course, you know, as fans of your model, we want to use it to help humanity to develop. And at the same time, we know we can't. You know, every it has to happen. You know, so it's like we have this map in our hand. I think yeah, it seems like it makes sense. You know, it could be a good possibility, and it does something with people knowing the map. And I and I told you maybe with this little example of the word uh, construct awareness. Yes. I didn't know that you invented it, but it struck <laughs> me when I first heard it. And now I wish I had used another word because it's so abstract. No, it's not. No, <laughs> <laughs> because for me it was very, it was like like very alive. So that's beautiful. Sometimes things you create or you judge in some way take on a whole other meaning for somebody else. We don't know. We can't control that. Mm -hmm. What word would you use now? I don't know what they would call it. <laughs> Originally, when I did the research, I called it post post autonomous, post autonomous, and then I differentiated the two the post autonomous responses because I thought I saw patterns into two stages: the the construct aware and the unitive. But this is just part of how you do science. I was wondering because first I read the word and I thought, oh, it's a strange word, but uh, but, but it's I'm, I'm curious about it. And then I tr started to see how my mind relates observations to that. Ah, maybe she meant that. Maybe it's this. I could be that. So it became more and more experiences related to the word. And by knowing the word, the word became a key. That is partially what we we also say that the way a person uses language gives me a key, gives me an idea of how they make sense of things. What words do they have available to themselves to express what they experience? What can they not even mention or notice? It's more what is not there. When I, when you score a test, you look what is not what is there. Yes, but also what is not yet there. What is inconceivable to this person? What can they not feel or think or, you know, judge yet? It's not there. It's not on their radar. Interesting. So so I thought when you came up with a word, was it because you described your own experiences? I don't think so. I, I was trying to find something that is deeper than relativistic, deeper than seeing that we're all program to see the world in a certain way in the conventional stages that's again seems true for all people in pretty much then you get this this realization at the first post conventional stage that that happened to you and then you try seriously to understand more of what other who are you what's how are you different from me all those interesting questions you have but you think we all have the same reality and we just have different interpretations of it different perspectives on it at the construct aware stage you become aware that all of it is stories yes. constructions and there is a, the field is also called constructive developmental theory since piaget i think he i don't know whether he coined the term but that's a name of the field, so construction, the idea that we construct our ideas and our meaning is, is fundamental to all of this. And that's a stage where you become aware of that. You mentioned Piaget, and were you also, that was one of the questions from our community, were you also influenced by Graves or Keegan? Keegan was my dissertation father, yes. 
clearly, but from the beginning, we agreed since he had his difficulties with Lavinia as well. That I could, I was old enough. I was in my 50s. So, you know, as a graduate student, he pretty much, and I was generous of him, let me do my own theory. He didn't require me to do his. I was his teaching fellow for four years. So certainly I'm very familiar with the theory. But he let me do my own. There are many parallels. Ours is more granular. And one of the things that to this day, fascinates me is that Wilbur and Spiral Dynamics and many others have, you know, several stages below conventional and several post-conventional and only two in the middle. When we all agree that 80% of people make meaning in the middle, that just as from a scientific perspective, that doesn't make any sense. Yes. If you look carefully, you see that there is a progression from the group-centric to the skill-centric to the the first self-authoring or whatever you call it. And they don't have it. They go from blue to orange or whatever they're calling it. It's, It's fascinating to me. Right. And that was my feeling when I saw it. This is where most of the development is happening. That's right. In the middle. And also the way... Spiral frames, the relativistic or the green. I thought, no, it's plus something. And they kind of frame it like, oh, these are the emotional guys and they're the hippies, you know, chanting around. And I thought, no, those are the people that had had a strong ego and now go a step further. For the first time, they realize, yes, that things are in, that we have interpretation. Anyway, it's just curious to me. It has always been a curious observation that they don't have the middle as a defined stage. Of course, it's a progression. Of course, they describe, but it's not the stage in, in and of itself, whereas I think it's one of the most powerful ones we have. And now that we have AI and all this machine learning, guess who programs <laughs> The, the computers is generally experts. It's people from that middle stage and some achievers and some later, but those who are attracted to that kind of statistical analysis are the people that, you know, that come from an expert place. So it's just interesting. And I, I'm curious what's going to happen. It's interesting because I often work with companies with engineers Yes. They say, yes, we like your model because engineers can relate to it because it, it's not esoteric. It's, it has this scientific background, you know, from, from the language constructivism. Eh? I'm glad if, if people can relate to it. Yes. And I, I used to leave out the transpersonal levels in my first book because I thought, oh, no, then they're all going to think it's esoteric, you know, <laughs> and, and you're gone, you know. And now in the second book, I included them. Okay. And you can always present that as hypothesis. There are people who think they can understand it in this way. You don't have to say this is real or anything like that. It is It is hypothetical. My theory is, and I'm not sure if you agree, but when I talk to people and ask them, do you have this profound experience in your life? Like a moment where you really were there and you were looking through your eyes and you were present and you felt yourself, you felt the outside. You somehow knew this is different, you know. I am, you know, some, some, most people have it. Yes, state experience, even baby have it. Freud described oceanic bliss of the newborn, where you're so completely, or in the womb, even when you're really in the ocean, if you will, that is part of that experience. It's just unconscious. And later on, many people have these moments. And it's really moments, it's peak experiences, and it goes away. And as soon as they're trying to explain it, they explain it with their current way of making meaning of things. And you can tell the difference. You have to interpret it. But at the same time, do you think it is a transpersonal experience? Maybe not. Maybe it's just weird. <laughs> I had somebody, no, somebody saying you had this strange often disconcerting because it doesn't fit. Am I going mad is the question I occasionally hear. Mm -hmm. 
It's all not, you know, it doesn't match anything I know. So there is even a concern about one's own sanity around it. It's not always beautiful. It's not always that way. So I ask myself sometimes, so how did, to distinguish these from, from strange experience? It's sometimes, I think, which is, of course, totally subjective, it is the sense of connectedness. And I think that is part of later stage of the unitive experience is that it's all connected. But the difference between a state and a stage is a stage is relatively stable. That's the place from which I look at the world most of the time. As I told you, the, the idea is to give people an idea of transpersonal thing and not make it something spooky, but try to say, maybe you know it already. That's certainly, and people can relate to that. That's helpful, yes. We do in the regular course, we do meditation at the end. Rather than talking about stage six or unity, we just do a meditation where people can Get a taste of it. That's the, the whole thing. It's called the strawberry meditation. It's where you eat the strawberry? You have it. You don't eat it yet. <laughs> At the end, you may, but you don't necessarily have to. You smell it. You lose Look at the whole history of how it became to be in your hand. Now, this particular one, out of zillions similar ones, just a way of, yeah, of helping people get that sense. We do also a meditation when I work with indigenous people, mostly non-indigenous, where we sit around the campfire, but with the sense that the trees talk, everything talks. They know the history. They have seen tribes come by and have seen generations of people come to this spot and do their ceremony. Everything's alive. And people can resonate with that. They have seen the mothers are there with their little ones. Some are nursing the source of great bliss for most children, being at the bosom and just being cared for in that beautiful way. That touches people also in a way that is not ordinary storytelling or ordinary experiences. What would it be like? What is it like to be you right now? That's the basic attitude and question we have when we do coaching or therapy. What is it like to be this person, you, right this moment, with your history, your feelings, your capacities, your worries, everything? What is it like to be you? I think that's a fundamental halting attitude we can have towards other human beings right and at the same time i'm only happening now because i'm with you that is also true and so we we do influence each other but not by telling you who you are or what you should become or what you all of that but by being with you in a way that allows you to become more of who you are and that has to do with compassion and other values, the kind of calmness that, that I have that then helps the other person be more open, more able to feel themselves actually often. And that's the whole thing. I think you mentioned it about values and the uh, development goals. I do think they're independent, not totally independent, they're connected to focus on character development is an important thing. Anybody at any stage can be compassionate. It doesn't matter you at what level you're at. It's all For all people, it's good to understand and feel what it means to be compassionate or forgiving or courageous. All of those things are not stage-related necessarily. And that I find very, very interesting because, you know, I came from the values. First, you know, I did my, my consultancy a lot about values. And then I realized, then I realized, well, the way people deal with values can vary. And that depends on their mindset. You know, some think a value, that's a moral thing. You have it, you own it, you are it. And you think, well, maybe not, you know. Or maybe you think you do and, and you experience. What your behavior shows something else. Yes. So, but the effort to help 
people be more aware of what, and even experiments, that's what I like about the IDGs, the field, what's it called, Kate now, has, has practical exercises across the board from kindergarten to later in which you people can experience what it's like, how you feel differently when you're kind, let's say, to your school body rather than like kids often are competitive or nasty or just I think that's an important part that is missing in developmental theory so far combining the two seems to be the most helpful yes that, that's very interesting because you we're talking about the IDG so you mentioned that the inner development goals which were invented or let's say invented there was an initiative to support the sustainable development goals, you know, the aims of the, the UNO to become more sustainable till 2030. And people realize, well, it doesn't happen because we need more inner development. Yes. And you were part of the, of the team who consulted, I guess, these, you know, and, and they work a lot with values. So this was kind of your idea or m many people's ideas. The ideas came from Björkman from Sweden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know him. If you listen to him, he has a beautiful one-hour expose of how he thinks about things. And then he convened a whole bunch of mostly Europeans, but a couple of, of us as well. So Keegan was there, the original meaning. I was there and some others. And we just talked about what would it take. So we wrote the manifesto how important the development of virtues or values actually is. And to me, it was always important because I don't think that later is always better. That idea that's now so prevalent, particularly in the, you know, even calling it vertical development already frames it something up is better than, you know, just the figure, you know, when we say this is no good, this is good. Up is good, down is not good. And always struck me as unreasonable because, of course, we know beautiful people at earlier stages. And we know people I do not have too much respect for because of their behavior at later stages. And so having the values, again, you, helps us clarify, to use the values term, some things that were not fully taken care of with developmental theories. Yeah, interesting. And I thought that the other way around, something that's not visible in the values that the developmental takes care of. <laughs> that's why, it's again, it's a good coming together. Now, I wish, again, wonderful intentions and the field kit is great. And there's now, I think we're starting the third phase of the research where it's actually going to be global. I think that's important. There is the Harvard Oxford Flourishing Project that looks what makes for a satisfying life, a healthy, satisfying, flourishing life. And that, that is totally research-based and have tons of really good global data. And so I prefer it a little bit in that sense. That's also some, let's say, critique on ego development. That's the Western stuff, you know, where we can say, oh, we are further than the others. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, and at this stage in my life, I don't have, you know, a career. I don't have to do anything I don't want to do, which is beautiful. And so I've decided to work on that, on bridge building between different cultures to at least expose some people who've never heard an indigenous person talk about how they make sense of, of things. Listen, you know, talk, bring them in and have them talk. Because I think that's the most powerful way to do it. Not me talking about it, but have somebody come in and, and share what it's like to be indigenous in that or the other way. So some people ask me, well, could it be an aim that people mature faster? Let's say we have a good education system, we have loving parents, we guide people wisely through the stages, you know, they learn about words, uh, constructing them, deconstructing them, getting relativity, looking at yourself as a subjective being. And by the end of 20, or let's say when they're 20, they're in contact with transpersonal experiences. So then we have a new world. Yes. 
And I do think that the trajectories are different. There are the ordinary ones, and there are some people, and also circumstances. I really, really was lucky, I guess, to one would today, one would say, to be gifted in many ways. So when I got lucky and had the right schools and, you know, the right people helping and the right help when I needed it, so that the trajectory was faster. Than, than most people would have. I think that's true. And the privilege. I mean, I'm so aware of how privileged I was. Could it be an aim for, let's say, looking at your children, the children of your theory, to make that possible for more people? Or will it just happen? And we are again at this point, well, we cannot design the future. Uh, no, to expose people to things that seem to make their lives easier and more healthful in any which way, it doesn't just have to be cognitively with ideas, to seems seems one, one of the things we as human beings we can do for each other. Not in the sense of saying, well, you're not yet there. I want, I, I have the need to have you be there. That to me is almost a crime. And there is some of that out there. It, it, because it's attached to the ego of the coach or the therapist or the person who brings the ideas to, to others. You have to be free of that, I think. Right. It, I find it kind of kind of a difficult because, you know, I'm also a map maker. In one of your podcasts, you talked about these people who keep creating maps and uh, models. Well, I have to, obviously. Even re redefining your maps or critiquing your maps is still map making. Right. And, and of course, it has its pleasure. You know, it has its help. You know, it, it helps you. Gratify. And, and it helps others. At the same time, you cannot avoid that people look at it in a, a careeristic way. Like if it's a career. And, and I always get asked, you, the way you explain it, you tell me this is better than that. And I said, well, it's not better, but it has more options. That is one of the advantages, yes. And I was, I don't know where we were talking about, well, how many people do we need at the post-conventional stages? I would say a few. And it would be very, very nice if those who have power make decisions for the rest of humanity, if those had that bigger perspective and capacity to see their own efforts and everyone else's in a historical context. But that's unfortunately not the case. But do you see any any persons out there where you would say, oh, yeah, there are a few uh, people? Hints of it. And then again, like I, I initially I thought maybe Obama might be post conventional but then the pressures of the office and all the political influences and negotiations, he did several things I don't think are post conventional They were fine, like everybody else's life, and especially those are who are under the loop all the time. Everything they do gets analyzed and, and critiqued. It's impossible. Do you think Nelson Mandela was a figure? Yes, he was. In some ways, he to do as well. There are people who are exemplars of wise and mature behavior, yes. But I think he had fights with his wife, as far as I, I'm not sure about the history, but certainly, you know, not above having lesser noble <laughs> aspects of but himself. Does one not have fights? At the later stage, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, but how you fight. The fights that I heard about were not exactly. Of course you do. And that the difference, how you negotiate differences, how you hold your word, how you hold them, as it's either I'm right or you're right or, or you know, we're wrong, or where it's dialogue is part, co conflict is part of being alive. Well, that's also what I'm often asked, you know, when I'm in organization, uh, you meet here and there post-conventional persons and they say, yes, you know, but how do I communicate everything I know to the others? Sometimes that's, the, that's part of the challenges of later stage. You can't actually communicate and you feel alone. I say, particularly the constructor where it, stage is the one where I most often have clients who initially say, I, I think I'm crazy. Nobody understands me. I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure 
whether what I'm thinking and feeling is even is sick or an outlier, I, I'm confused. And then we make the distinctions between feeling lonely and being able to hold solitude, to keep yourself intact, even when the rest of the world does not appreciate who you are or how you are or doesn't understand you. It's hard. It can be hard to feel that nobody in my environment understands me. Truly, you know, because we all, are. I think the English proverb is, want to be birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. And this this being connected, you know, we had it a few times, you know, connected to what? Since, of course, you realize I'm completely alone within my own consciousness. There's nobody, nobody in there that me in there. <laughs> and my talking and my story making and meaning making. And you think, oh, could anybody please visit? You know, no, nobody comes. You know, they always stay outside and then you get in touch in once in a while. But at the same time, you're never disconnected. Not if you are aware of the connection, but many people do feel isolated and discon truly disconnected, lonely, lonely in, in that sense. And there's research just how much having connection or just human connection makes a difference in people's longevity, like having a growing plant, a little nature with you. Also, the co having human company makes a difference in how you experience life and how important it is. So you think this this kind of seeing that life is a river, to, to use that phrase, in the later stages, and I'm in it and I'm bothering in it, you know, and, and it happens and people happen and life happens. Is that not connecting you on a deeper level also to, let's say, something like love? I tend not to use the word love because, again, it's just, yeah, but it is compassion, love, whatever you want to call it. It is that care. It's the care behind it for everything around you, not just for yourself, I would say. And you certainly can call that love. Love for everything. And then maybe the loneliness goes away or so. I don't know. Or maybe not. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> dying from my perspective I don't know you know I don't believe I don't know whether there is an afterlife so I don't particularly believe in a higher being that guides it and organizes it <laughs> so I don't know how death will be I'm curious I hope the biggest fear and I'm just the other day I read a survey from a colleague who asked alchemists construct aware people about life and death issues, how, how they felt about various things. And, and several of them worried about Alzheimer's. You have a, a vibrant mind. I certainly think I do still. I'm, I'm enjoying myself. I cook. I love. I dance. I sing. And what, what if I lose my mind? That's a real concern. I don't, well, I don't know. I don't know how I will be in five years. Who knows? That's interesting that you say that because we, we, we talked a bit in, in front and I told you my father had Alzheimer. And of course, a, so a thought came to me, well, what if I also get it? Yeah. Of course, that's because, and I think that's an interesting thing, because we are so in the West, and particularly us, you know, the theoreticians and the <laughs> developmentalists, we are so in this. And so our minds and our hearts are powerful means we have access to. Not everybody does. I think I mentioned my Down syndrome cyst. That was from the beginning. I was around. She was older than I was. I had this example of the limitations so I do think having healthy intellect, not, not super smart, but just a regular healthy capacity to think and analyze is also part of the, the luck we have if we have it. We don't, nobody deserves talents or whatever. They just come as, as a gift. And who, who, who gives you the gifts? I don't know. Because it can be very uneven. One child can be Down syndrome and the other can be actually unusually smart. That to me is the randomness of life. The interesting part with my father was he was deteriorating and you could 
actually see how you go oh, was getting younger 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 in a way you know in a way more like a child yes, yes he was like a child but he kept his values okay that's interesting and, yeah. and in a way he never lost his kindness that is that's what i would hope for myself that i'm not becoming a crotchety negative you know paranoid person at the end but we don't know That's what I thought when I was sitting at his grave, you know, looking at him. And I thought, oh, my God, this is big. To be able to go through having Alzheimer and not lose your kindness, you know, and he did it. And he did it. And I thought, oh, Father, you know, I hope I can live up to that. You know, Beautiful. And we don't know who who, who we are going to be and what, what coming down the, towards us as challenges. It's interesting, you know, that this ego development um, focuses on a certain aspect of our, let's say, meaning making with words and then deconstructing that. But what does it not look at? Tons of th things. I mean, that its advantage is that it's sort of humanistic, a whole person theory. But then there are others who look at specific details how does the aesthetic sense develop how does the moral sense develop they're more specific in that than we are so again different ways of looking at the same object which is in this case development different people have different emphasis and different sensibilities that they then can use to explicate things. Because the interesting thing is that you said that, that people can be nice, you know, on every stage or kind and everything. So it seems like a, a separate dimension and maybe also a separate dimension of development. So that's the value, the value thing that I think, or just of being a human being, that we have values and that some values are more helpful to the rest of the people there is and some are less and some people come with them they're just as you say kind thoroughly kind as a person from probably for a long time since you knew him and others are like that not, not no fault of anybody it's just the way we come into the world You, you think we come with something genetically or? <laughs> Again, favorite word, I don't really know. <laughs> genetics, may, genetics may play a role now that I think of my sister. She was talented. I often thought when we were, you know, teenagers that if she had been regular, normal mind, not limited by Down syndrome, she would have become a uh, fantastic thespian she was so good at interpreting and mimicking all her teachers everybody anything she saw she would dance she would talk in their voices she was just fantastic at this and i had no not much talent for that particular thing she could sing and she played the flute quite amazingly well and yet she didn't know money she couldn't you could give her a handful of coins and a note and say which one would you rather want the hundred dollar note or the handful of coins and of course she would ch choose the, the coins <laughs> yeah they're more real which is true <laughs> so the most one, but it's also giving our growing up with that i did i think did sensitize me to the limitations also and and how You can still be a precious human being and influence others. When she was in an elder's home, I don't know why we're talking about this, but it is part, again, who made me who I am. She was able, when she died, they, they were talking about how she was the moral police. So she would tell others, and, and even just, you know, how to eat neatly and nicely. Some of the women there were you know, very from very un socialized places but she tried always to keep a certain standard within her own limitations and make a difference to the whole community she was in i i teasingly say police because, <laughs> <laughs> because that's probably part of strengths and her limits as well that she really she got upset when people fought or when they had bad manners or things like that. It really bothered her. 
That's interesting. You know, I read a bit uh, Umberto Maturana. Probably uh, you know him, yeah? No, tell me about it. Umberto Maturana, the tree of life. He... Oh, Umberto just didn't hear the word, of course. So he says, uh, and I like that picture, uh, that the words are a, a reaction to our feelings. So basically, we're beings that feel first, and then we have some kind of uh, changes of relationship in the outside that we experience that leads to disbalances within ourselves and to our meaning making. And then we use words to balance these feelings. So we, we get a sense of, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So words are a reaction to feelings. Experience, I would say, yes. Not necessarily feelings can be sensations, can be, I mean, the, the range of things, feelings is a relatively narrow word. Yes, probably something that, tri that triggers some response, but also in our nervous system, pain, uh, joy. Relating to your sister who responded to this quite, quite frankly, or quite openly, you know, she had to say, no, no, it has to be different. You know? <laughs> and, and so the feeling comes first and also that, or let's say the experiences come first and they are also the ones that lead to further development because if you experience things that do not make sense in your regular meaning making, then you change your meaning making. If you can, but we you know, are all used to also ignore things that don't fit our current mindset. We are able to do it horizontally. We add something to the explanation we already have, but if we're not necessarily transformed by this experience, does it, that doesn't fit. I would say more often than not, we accommodate horizontally or laterally, but we don't necessarily grow every time some information or some sensation or some feeling comes in we don't understand and so often we just ignore it we just put it on the, the rug because we can't we don't want to deal with it too hard it's too painful well one of my observations maybe maybe is you have a different one but, but i'm curious about it is when i go to companies for instance and i explain them the model you know it's like this uh, scientists in there saw this of course, it makes sense. You know, I say, oh, wow, yeah, yeah, now I see more and I know this guy is this and this guy, my wife is that and, and everything. You know, they, they start this labeling, which is fine. But then you I usually do group work and little groups where they talk about development, about their own and how they change their meaning making and all that. And then they realize usually we don't talk like this. This is a different way of opening up and a different referent experience and the Room of discussibilities, Besprechbarkeiten in German, you know, is it gets bigger. It's and bigger. That's part of, yes, and that's part of the offering we can have if we have a sense or an awareness, like let's say the developmental theories, if we can help others experience themselves in a new way, not talking about the theory, you know, about which which I which we call about this, and you can learn. Anything complex from a stage four perspective, that's just because that's what we can do. But can you embody it? Can you actually use it in order to create the technical terms? Is the container for people to experiencing something new, that or something different, that is gives a good chance for people to say, oh, how beautiful. I can see myself in a new way. I can see my wife in a new way. And then we get into all the trouble about assessing your dear ones. <laughs> the others. What about the others? <laughs> well, that's, that's, yes. And that's still when you see yourself, and that's a beautiful thing about indigenous understanding, that there is no others the whole idea of others and othering is, is part of the problem. There are no others. But we do. And, and human beings, again, we all do that. Because they, they exist in your head and you make them what you think they are. But they are not. They are, they are autonomous. <laughs> that is right. And, and that's human. That is not. The only thing we can do is become, again, aware when we do this. 
And it's also true that when you, and that's true for me and for you probably too, when you learn a new theory, it's like a child who gets a hammer. Everything becomes a nail. Yes. You apply it, you over-apply it. Yes, 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 I can see that. And at the same time, it's fun to see everything as a nail. <laughs> and It is. And then you have to learn not to do that as well, to know when to apply it and when it is not. Right, right. And at the same time, I could see that. And let's let's go back to having these experiences and relating them. When you say the strawberry experience, where you say, okay, really, you know, the, the John Cabot sinner thing takes the raisin, you know. <laughs> and you could do one thing, just eat the strawberry in a very conscious way and be very attentive. Or you say you relate it to a model. And you relate the experience to a model. You know, what you now experience is a later stage. Yes. And then it becomes something different because. A stage, but again, a state. A stage. Yes. yes, yes. Experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's the same. Let's say when I go to a company and I say, this is the model. And now we're going to talk a bit. And you see the way we talk is in a different state. And you can have more of that, you know, and it's just available. You can take the door. As I say, you have to be a little careful because I, mushrooms help people get to these unusual experiences where this, the separation between self and the rest of the world disappears. But some of these are horrid. I've had many reports of really, really tough experiences that way. But if you can put it back together at the end, You have to allow yourself to be deconstructed <laughs> for a few hours and then you say, okay. So the recommendation, of course, is you never do it with, with, un, with alone and you always have a guide or somebody who actually knows what can happen so that they can deal with things go wrong. Actually, I, I've never met somebody who regretted that experience. I have met people who've had a horrendous time. Yes, but And did they regret it? <laughs> they don't yeah. in the long run. But they're also only people that I know are post-conventional, have the where in the resources and the resources outside to make sense of it. I would, you know, just a delicate thing that now is a new fad, certainly in the United States, I think in some of the European countries as well. To have it, it's like another consumerism thing. <laughs> well, yes, yes, and no, you know, and and I think it has to do with reference experiences, and I th and I think for some people to be in this transpersonal state and and be in nature and and experience yourself in nature, you know, in in such an open state and 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 see, oh, this is also possible. In the world of consciousness, this can also be an experience of being a human. And it gets me in touch with myself, with my partial personalities. I can see my emotions and I can see lots of things. It changes your perspective and, and can open doors. It can. Ideally, it can. I'm just saying I, I would be cautious to do it in safe and experienced environment, not just because it's available now more broadly. Did you try? Not since my student days in Switzerland. And now I'm in a physical condition where that's no longer a good idea. I don't <laughs> think much so. I, I, don't, I think also in, at old age it can be done. <laughs> well, depends on your condition. It's fine. I have had so really plenty of transpersonal moments and experiences without any drugs, just by meditation or by hap hap again by happenstance. They just came that that I don't have feel the need. I need more of it, but I'm curious. I wished. <laughs> I am curious. Well, and I think you know if one is interested in the development the development of consciousness. I mean, this is one of the options for a scientist to investigate. Yeah? It is. And so now more and more people actually have access because legally it's even in some states already in the United States, it's okay again. The research is okay again, where it was, you know, had severe punishments in the past when people experiment, profess.
Harvard experimented. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. You were there when Timothy O'Leary was there? No, you mean Ram Das. Ram Das, yes. Yeah, I met him too. He's beautiful. And he was old and beautiful experience with him and funny too. <laughs> It's interesting. When you look at the future, you see all this, you know, how the world is. But you don't speculate about the future, so I can't ask you this anyway. You can't. Uh, yeah. Let's see what comes I up. Wonder, I'm wondering about it. I'm a little concerned. Yes? What makes you concerned? Just that the artificial intelligence is becoming so good, both in words, the test I did, the maturing test recently, that the answers for the test were reasonable. They were at least stage four, but what they were missing, there was no questioning. It was all, this is how it is. You know what you can do? Like, like the, the GPT, you know, is kind of this, in German we say Rechthaber, I don't know the English word. He always knows what is right. He gives you the right answer. It's like this, this, this. Of course, because its sources of data are the scientific, the literature, I mean, about 500 billion pieces of data. You can take the answer and put it in another AI that changes the style and makes it... That I haven't seen yet. I wonder, that's where I, I just curious, how can it change the style? Can it actually, because it doesn't know, it doesn't sense, it doesn't make meaning it's just using the most common ways of how people speak or how it's in the data to then say that is how to do it it's it was marvelous it was amazing and yet it was clear that it was not a human being my, my son is actually very much into that and we want to train try to train i to speak from different uh, stages so you, you give them reference text Yes, and you tell them, well, these sentences are this, you know, the criteria for, for meaning making, and you try to train it and then ask them a question and ask it to give answers in different stages. That would be an, a fascinating and I think an up-to-date experiment that that would be curious what comes out. Colleagues of mine already have an, an AI app that, because, of course, the test is so time-consuming that the cost for having highly trained people, psychologists, you know, PhD level, doing the work is, is prohibitive. At best, you can do a leadership team or some or individuals, but now they want to do it in a much broader space where they can do a thousand people at once for a company, everybody. And so there is an app for that. I have this positive theory about AI. When, when you think about that, the different stages brought up different media of con con communicating. Let's say the early stages had stories, and then you had the book, you know, conformistic state. This is the book. Then you had books, the scientists, many books, and you always compare to books. And then they had the mass media for the next stage. And then relativistic state, you have internet. Everybody can say everything, and it's all out there. So in a way, the algorithm bring a new sense of order to it. They organize mass data. So instead of having this relativistic mess, you, know, you can now say, okay, put it into some kind of order. And, and it's, it's like suddenly you can look at thousands of answers or whatever data and make order, bring order to it. True enough. And it would be, as I say, I hope I get to be along, around long enough to see the results of your experiment with your and, and your sons. But my concern is also just the availability of data. That, well, I guess you could go much broader. You could read all the spiritual literature and feed that into the computer. But then I'm not sure you would measure ego development. You would probably measure something else. Maybe you're more interested, I mean, you said it repeatedly, in consciousness. I, I still read um, the debates around what is consciousness. Is it just a matter of brain structures? Is it all in the brain? Or is there something else? What is it? I did send you this little talk from Alan Wallace, the Buddhist. Uh, I like that very much. Those things where I say we can't really know, we can be touched by it, we, be, we can even be inspired by it or transformed occasionally when you get 
but we don't know what it is. I don't think it's just the brain. No. Really, truly, don't. I think there's more to being a human being than just all the chemical processes and, and synopsis firing and areas, you know. That, to me, seems, what is the word I'm looking for? When you reduce things, reductionism. Well, we, we talked about it earlier a bit, that looking at your own eye, you know, your story, it is this hypnotic space of memories, of emotions, of past, of, of meaning-making, and it's not even yours. And it changes. I like Milton Erickson, you know, it's never too late for a happy childhood. You can always reinterpret it. Yes, and then that's part of what you do in therapy or in coaching, to, to reinterpret, to restore, if you want, new narrative about, about what happened, rather than being stuck in a negative old one. Right, so you have this body, you know, which ages and then goes away, and then you have your, your mind or your consciousness, which is kind of this morphosis that changes all the time, you know, and it, you think it's me, and then you think, no, it's not me. You know, it's happening. <laughs> and then, then, then you, you hopefully less identify it and see how it happens. And it somehow interacts with the body, but it's separate. And there are people who feel that Hara has a consciousness, a different one, that the heart actually has nerve systems and has consciousness of some sort, not the same as the mind, but still some se some way to experience. There's so much interesting research and thinking out there about the possibilities of consciousness, what it is, what it isn't, and different opinions. All I can always say at the end is really I'm still alive. I breathe, I eat, I love, if you want that word. I care, and and that seems to be plenty. Mm -hmm. This is one one idea we talked about Umberto Maturana, you know, the, the experiences and how they help us, how interacting with the experiences, or also values, you know, what, what is value actually? And this is one idea of conscience. And there's one that there are many definitions. Is I mean, all these words are kind of orbits in themselves, but one definition is... A well, they're abstract and different languages. I know that the difference in French between conscience means both conscience and consciousness. You know, so this is the fascinating thing about language. We're always trying to name experiences and then invent words to try and capture it. But of course you can't capture it in, in a true sense. Right, right, because they're completely abstract to the ex actual experience. <laughs> and the word abstract in Latin means pulling away from the, the lived experience. As soon as it's abstracted, it's no longer the variety, immediacy of real, in real experience, day-to-day, moment-to-moment experience. So, so one person framed it, you know, how do we develop or how does it actually happen? And he said, yeah, well, usually we experience contradictory emotions one after the other. We're kind of in our role-bound identities, partial identities, you know, I might say this and feel this and an hour later something else. And then there are moments when I feel it at the same time. And again, to be able to feel it at the same time takes a certain level of recognition of cognitive probably of, of cognitive capacity because many people don't realize when they have conflicting emotions to be able to hold ambivalence and say yes i'm this and that right now i feel both is is a later stage capacity one theory is that the conscience makes you feel it others say the other way yes <laughs> so these are areas that human beings, philosophers, psychologists, whoever, are still fascinated with. Scientists who are pure, you know, materialistic scientists. We're going out there to find, are there human beings on other planets? Sentient beings, we wouldn't, not, I don't mean humans, just, is there other consciousness out there that we could relate to? That, that's endless curiosity. So is there... 
when you look at your life as a scientist, are there open ends or you think, yeah, I did my part and it's all fine? Or it's it all open, everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. And and I guess I'm I'm at ease with that because it's the momentary sense of being alive that seems to matter more to me. I also accepted that I will not have fixed the world when I'm gone. <laughs> well, certainly not that that would be such a hubristic hubris was that how do you say that in English? Hybris, hybris. Hybris, yeah. hybris yeah kind of idea at best i think we can sow some seeds and hope that they fall some of them not all of them but some of them fall on fertile ground and grow and develop into something else but that's about the best we can do can we yes so if your seeds fell in my brain on a certain ground. I hope it was, it's a flourishing one. So I thank you for that. And uh, it's, it's very, very interesting to experience that, that I got so much from you and I never met you before. You know, at the same time, you're part of my inner processes with your ideas, you know, and, and I, so that goes on. I learned the most when I'm in dialogue. And being challenged or even listening to my own thinking and saying, oh, I mean to say it that way or, oh, that's an interesting way how that came out. <laughs> it's just, it's the interaction that seems more viable to me than, than but that can be a personality feature too. Actually, I talked with some people today and we were talking, we, we started this initiative in Germany called Emergizer, you know, from Energizer to Emerge, Emergizer, you know, to see how can we foster the idea that something can emerge. So these are all people who are into vertical development, so <laughs> into ego development. And they all kind of say, yes, so we cannot really do it, but we want to do something. <laughs> want to give it space and room, but at the same time, we want to not achievers. <laughs> so, so it's kind of this conflict. And, and then we talk about, so what would be an ideal scenario? And we came up with the idea, and maybe it's something that you can reflect on. One is, of course, to get that the maps are known. That you bring the ideas out so so they're known because they do something with your mind once you understand oh yeah there's some kind of development possible it makes you look at yourself differently but to really bring it into imagination you need people to talk about it and so the different forms there are practices like Burmian dialogue that i found when when we did it actually helpful how do we listen? What do we notice? What do we not notice? Can you do it, you know, in a circle and now you turn all people around so we can't actually see each other? What happens when we dialogue? There's all kinds of interesting ways you can actually help people become aware of how they tend to interpret whatever is happening and what triggers them and what doesn't trigger them. And, you know, that's so part of the self-discovery. And it's emergent because it's not, you can't predict in beforehand what's going to happen if you have a, a good, there's many ways you can practice that. When we have people who say, oh, I'm interested in ego development, what would you recommend them? <laughs> First of all, take a test, read, read the, the papers out there freely to just download. And then if you're really interested in, get together with others to discuss it what you experience and if you're really serious come to a workshop that goes really a deep dive what we call a deep dive that both makes you understand yourself and others in a more subtle way not just you know your dad or your dad you're green or you're red kind of pigeonholing of people and how to then optimally interact with people at other levels that we all have to interact with all the time without, you know, by really understanding where they're coming from. So you can speak, if you will, their language, their way of approaching life so that there's some resonance not coming from a cathedral or up, you know, <laughs> or a pulpit and saying, this is what you have to do, not that kind of thing. It reminds me of Barbara Küchler, you know her, also from Switzerland, who also 
writes books about this and I had a podcast with her and she said very something very charming which I like to quote she said well before you know when, when I was at earlier stages I thought the world was full of idiots <laughs> no. and then they all disappeared <laughs> Again, the construct aware stage is also the first that doesn't take itself so seriously. You can laugh, cosmic laughter. Just say, look what fools we are. Yes, you made this really nice YouTube video on fooling. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so th that's part of, of the lightness as well of being. Just, yeah. And I always like it, of course, etymologically. Delight, enlightenment. Lightness, they're all related. So should we end by saying we know we're all fools? <laughs> <laughs> In a good way, because that's what human beings, that, that's what we do. We, we create maps and then we have to say, well, <laughs> it's not sufficient. And then we can laugh at our own, what we call shenanigans in English, our own attempts at nailing down reality and name it and this is it, this is what it is and it's just a hopeless cause and you can either be upset by it or start smiling at human folly. <laughs> I sometimes think, you know, if we are not optimistic, who can be optimistic? I'm saying I'm not an optimist, but I'm also not a pessimist, I'm a realist, I would say. <laughs> On a realistic perspective, would you, would you have expected so many wonders in your life? I don't know. I mean, what different people... I seem to have more wonders than some people, and they, I don't know what to describe that to. Again, a gift from somewhere, the happenstance, the luck of one's birth, and, you know, upbringing, formation, I don't know. Or you also mentioned something as grace. Huh? Yes, grace is a good word for that. So that's where I'm hoping to be able to draw from the grace I've already received. And I definitely need, like everybody else, need as much of it as we can to live a meaningful life. So thank you, Suzanne, for this wonderful exchange and these gifts of your experience. I was, was uh, very insightful and also to hear about your way because I, I have never heard that you know how you came to that and it was very revealing thank you for your openness thank you for dialoguing with me and making me reflect <laughs> on some of those questions yes and I, I keep you on track on our research on gpt you know <laughs> and maybe <laughs> maybe it, you know let's see <laughs> Let's see and be cautious. Not everything that brilliant and novel is actually a good thing. How do you know? Uh, how do you know? Well, but by the consequences, if there are unforeseen consequences, which is often what happens when you have good intentions. And then later on, you realize the downsides of whatever you try to create. Yes, it's human nature. We want to know. We want to experiment. Do you see any, any any downsides of your research that you say, oh, that also had consequences I didn't see? People misusing it or simplifying it to the degree where it's actually no longer right or using it to pigeonhole others. To, you know, say you're that, you're that, and then that's it. I don't want to hear anymore. I know who you are. That, that. That's a danger with all the developmental theories that they're being misused. But that's true with everything that human beings do. We, we can make something good or something not so good out of it. You know how so much of the developmental theories does not look beautiful and not the good. It only looks the mind objective. How can we measure these things? That's, that's a, a limitation. And IDGs now bring the good in, and I think the aesthetic is another aspect that is not often enough taken into account, the aesthetic human experience, when it turns to, into an ecstatic human <laughs> experience. <laughs> okay.
let's say goodbye. Thanks a lot, Suzanne. Huh?